numerous continuing education programs for attorneys, CPAs, social workers, and healthcare administrators throughout Central Arkansas. He's conducted over 500 seminars throughout Central Arkansas over the past 25 years. Frank received his Bachelor of Science from Hendricks College in Conway and a Julius Doctorate from the University of Arkansas Little Rock School of Law. Now what's not in this, but I do want you guys to know that Frank is my uh, landlord. Uh, we, we rented there, we're one of his oldest land. Well, we're not really one of his oldest uh, tenants, but we have been one of his longest tenured tenants. <laughs> Just want to make that up. Now, uh, having worked with Frank, uh, we seen quite often the hallways, and we discuss religion and politics and a lot of different things. And we were having one of our friendly chats the other day, and Frank got in my face and he said, "Listen, if you say anything to embarrass me, or if you say anything to embarrass my profession, I'm going to increase your rent." <laughs> so, what I'd like to do is introduce the most knowledgeable, kind, <laughs> courteous, intelligent, creative. Delightful, generous, and humble person. I know. Help me welcome Frank. Do that. just uh, for a few minutes here and uh, we're going to talk about two main uh, topics today kind of give you just a little bit more detailed background uh, uh, my areas of practice involve lots of revocable trust which remain to avoid probate we do lots of irrevocable trust to protect assets from the nursing home and uh, that's five-year pre-planning and then we do lots of crisis planning that's for the person uh, that really they feel like they don't have any hope. They're in the nursing home. They've not done any planning whatsoever. Those, we do a lot of work with those people as well. So uh, earlier somebody said, are you going to give us any inspiration? I said, well, I'm going to give you hope. And part of that hope is if somebody has not done any planning, please get some help somewhere because there are things can be done. I'm going to give you some actual examples today of things that can be done in cases where most people feel there's just nothing we can do. We've given up all hope. We're going to lose everything we have. So. And then we do a lot of planning with veterans and their widows <clears throat> on a benefit called aid and attendance. I probably do 30, 40 workshops uh, every year and probably of, of the hundreds of people that I, I meet, less than one or two percent know about aid and attendance even exists, much less how it works and how you qualify. So we're going to talk about these topics and hopefully give you some good information today. See if I can, there we go. <clears throat> uh, Here's three conditions or three times that you may find yourself in a nursing home and wondering, what do I do? Uh, first is rehab. That's where you're going in temporarily because you've got a broken hip, broken foot, pneumonia, maybe a concussion, some type of sickness. Uh, you're just going to be there for maybe one or two months, maybe a few weeks. The second is you've entered a nursing home long term. That means you're probably not going to return home, and that's when kind of panic stage hits for most people. Or for people that have been in the nursing home for one year, two years, three years, uh, and they're just slowly going broke, okay? So uh, just some facts and information, because most people, unless you've got a loved one or relative in this situation, you may not know. The average cost of nursing home, according to the Department of Human Services, which administers Medicaid, is $5,168 a month. Here in Conway, it really runs between about $5,000 and $7,500 a month. It continues to go up. Uh, also, if you give all your assets away, you may have to wait five years before you qualify for Medicaid. So that's the, it used to be three years. Most people are familiar with that. Now it's actually five years. So those are some things that people are struggling with. Uh, if you find yourself in a nursing home, is there any hope? I have people, uh, just a couple weeks ago, a brother or sister came in and they sit, they sit down at the, the conference table and we're sitting there visiting and, and you could just see it on their face. They were down, they thought we're just gonna lose everything we got done. They saved a lot more assets than they, they thought they ever could. So, is there any hope or is it too late to plan? Will you lose everything at the rate of five, six, seven thousand dollars per month? So we're here to give hope. Uh, if you're in rehab in a nursing home, I'm going home, back home pretty soon. I'll be home in another, another month or two at most. Why do I need to plan? And the reason being is, now, while you're in rehab, this is a golden opportunity, 
maybe the only time you have to plan and protect your home and savings, everything you've got, in the next one, two, or three years. So don't pass this opportunity yet. You may be able to protect your home in just the next two or three years, but only if you plan while you're in rehab before you return home. We call this a rehab one, two, three plan. So here's just an example. John and Jane Doe, married couple. Jane's in rehab because she's broken her hip. Uh, they have a home that's $110,000 and about $50,000 in savings. Uh, Jane will probably go home in the next four to eight weeks. This is a very typical client for me. Sometimes I got more, sometimes I have less. Uh, but she's going to be going home in one or two months. So what do they do? Well, if at this time they will transfer her home and savings into an irrevocable trust, it's an asset protection trust, and then Jane files her Medicaid application, and then she goes home. She can't go home before she files the application. But she files her application, she goes home. What happens? Well, when she files her application, the first question that Medicaid asks is this. Jane, have you made any gifts in the last five years? Well, as a matter of fact, I gave away my home and all my liquid assets two weeks ago. Medicaid's going to say, well, Jane, we're not going to pay for the next $160,000 in your care. Whatever you gave away, we're not going to pay that much. Well, exactly how long is that? Well, Medicaid says uh, $160,000 will pay for a nursing home at $5,116 a month. That's their number for about 32 months. Therefore, Jay, we're not going to pay for your care for the next 32 months. Now, if you're in the nursing home 32 months from now, come back and see us, and then we'll talk again. So 32 months after application, Jane is, will become eligible. All her assets will be protected if she is in the, in the nursing home again. Of course, Jane has gone home. And 32 months uh, have gone by. Jane's in the front yard, and she's planting some flowers. So if she goes back to the nursing home, she's going to be uh, uh, qualified for Medicaid, and the home's going to be protected. John comes out in the front yard, and uh, he's standing there watching her plant flowers. He has a stroke, falls down, goes to the hospital, ends up in the nursing home permanently. Now here's the question. We plan for Jane with all her assets. Will John be qualified for Medicaid once he's in the nursing home, and will the home and savings be protected? What do you think? Yeah. Some say yes, some say no. As a matter of fact, yes. If you're married and you do a rehab one, two, three plan for one spouse, it applies to both spouses. So if John goes in after that 32 months, he's going to be qualified, and uh, all the home and savings will be protected. So now you plan for both spouses. This is very important because there's ways you can plan for just one spouse. This is typically the better better route to go. Also, if Jane goes back to the nursing home, will she uh, be quite eligible for Medicaid? Yes. And the home and the savings will be protected. So what happened here? Let's go back to the time that Jane is in the nursing home. She doesn't feel good. John doesn't want to do this planning. He doesn't want to get all this paperwork together. He doesn't want to follow all this stuff. Well, John, if you do this, all your assets are going to be protected in about two and a half years. Well, Mr. Duden, we'll come in when Jane gets home and she gets feeling better, and then we'll do all this. Well, you can do that, but now you're going to have a 60-month wait. So you just cut your asset, your penalty period in half. So this is a golden opportunity for a lot of people just to do some planning and protect everything. So while you're in the nursing home and rehab, you got two goals. It is file your application and start the penalty, then get well and go home. Most people, just this is human nature, their goal is I just want to get well and go home as fast as I can. So uh, this is the time just to slow down and maybe do some planning that will really, really benefit you. Any questions on that? All right, let's talk about situation number two, crisis planning. This is for somebody that's in the nursing home, they have done no planning at all. Many times they don't even have a will, perhaps, or, or, or a power of attorney. But they've done no uh, planning uh, for, for nursing home. If this person does nothing, so I'm talking about my average client now, if they do nothing, they will spend all their liquid assets, CD, savings, IRAs, retirement plans, somewhere in the neighborhood, uh, neighborhood of three, three months to three years, and all they'll have left is their home. At that time, the nursing home will say, when you run out of money, we'll apply for Medicaid. They own their home, they'll qualify for Medicaid, but then as Medicaid begins to run up a bill, when they die, both husband and wife, a lien can be placed against the home and then they can lose the home as well, so they've lost virtually everything. So the goal here in crisis planning is to save about half of what, half or more of what we got left. Sometimes we can do a little bit better. So 
here's just one example. There's a lot of different ways you can do this planning, lots of different uh, 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 methods and planning techniques. But this is a basic, what I call, half a loaf. Dad, he's in the nursing home. He's got $50,000 in savings and $1,000 in his checking account. And Dad just knows one thing. I can't have over $2,000 if I qualify for Medicaid. So he calls his son. He says, son, here's my last $50,000. He gives it to his son, and Dad applies for Medicaid. First question that Medicaid asks is, Dad, have you made any gifts in the last five years? Well, yeah, I just gave away my last $50,000 to my son. He doesn't have a home, doesn't have a car, doesn't need nothing else. So Medicaid is going to say, well, Dad, since you gave away $50,000, we're not going to pay for the next $50,000 of your care. Well, how long is that? Well, at $5,168 a month. Medicaid says, we're not going to pay for the next 10 months of your care. So Dad calls his son up and says, son, you still got that $50,000? No, Dad, I just bought a car. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that can be a problem. No, Dad, I still have the $50,000. Well, good. I need you to pay the nursing home $5,000 a month for the next two months because, you know, they said I don't qualify for Medicaid. Then he reapplies, and of course, after all of his money's been spent down, he qualifies for Medicaid, but all of his savings is gone. That is the way Medicaid wants this penalty to work. And that's the way it works for most people, unless they get some help or some advice. So, luckily, the son says, let me make a call, Dad. So he comes in and talks to an elder law attorney. What should be done? We would advise the son, let's give back half the money to Dad. Give back Dad back $25,000. So what that does, the gift is reduced from $50,000 to $25,000, which in turn reduces that penalty from 10 months down to five months. And then, after five months of gift back, Dad reapplies for Medicaid, and he's going to be approved in month six. So once he's approved in month six, Medicaid's going to pay the nursing home from then on. Of course, they need to keep Dad's income. But the son still has how much? $25,000. So you just saved $25,000. Probably that's an irrevocable asset protection trust with all the kids on there as trustees and beneficiaries. So somebody didn't go buy a car. So, uh, in many cases, dad has a home, has a farm, has other investments. I mean, that's very typical. So it's, it can be a little bit more complicated. We may use uh, home equity swap techniques or you know, car swap techniques, different things to qualify them and, and keep that penalty down. And it may require other advanced planning techniques, but this just shows you there are things that can be done. So. And then here's the third third category, the nursing home resident. This person is a client that has been in the nursing home for one year, maybe two years, maybe three years, and they started with three, four, five hundred thousand dollars. I've had people that have started at between nine hundred and a million dollars, nine hundred thousand to a million dollars, and after eight years, they finally come in and said, "Hey, I need some help." And they got three hundred thousand left. In that particular case, we put a plan together that would save two hundred of the 300 but I asked the son because that's when they came in I said how much did dad have when he went in eight years ago he said it's close to a million dollars and if you got some help we could save 80 90 percent of that program. so but if this person does nothing at all most likely all their assets are going to be gone from three months to three years why because this person in general these people are spending between three thousand and six thousand dollars a month out of their savings so their savings is slowly going down. Our goal is to save at least half of what's left. So, let's take this case. We have a husband and wife. Uh, he's been in the nursing home for three years. Three years ago, they had a $210,000 home, a nice home, and about $300,000 of savings, investments, retirement plan, and so forth. Now, three years later, after that, the husband's been in the nursing home for three years, they have a $210,000 home, and a hundred and fifty thousand dollars in savings and investments. So, where does that hundred fifty thousand dollars go? Well, they're spending about four thousand dollars a month out of their savings to help pay for the nursing home. So, in three more years, if the wife or husband does nothing, they will have a home and no money whatsoever. Then the nursing home will apply for Medicaid. They'll qualify, and the lien can be placed on the home. And after the husband and wife pass away. The home can be taken as well. So we've caught them now with the home in 150,000. That's where they're at right now. So 
what we do is we give one third of the home to the child. That's a seventy thousand dollar gift. We give the remaining cash to the child. We give all that to them, uh, and that's a hundred fifty thousand dollar gift. Now we just don't give cash to kids and then put them in personal bank accounts. These usually go into irrevocable trust. Okay, so we've got some checks and balances and so forth. And then we apply for Medicaid. Of course, the first thing that Medicaid's going to ask is, Dad, Mom, have you made any gifts in the last five years? He says, yes, I just gave away my home and all my money, which is about $220,000. So Medicaid says, we're not going to pay for the next $220,000 of your care. Well, exactly how long is that? Well, the average cost, according to Medicaid, is $5,168 a month. So Medicaid says, you have a 44-month penalty. We are not going to pay for your care for the next 44 months. Come back in 44 months, and we'll talk again and probably qualify you at that point. So, in the meantime, what do we do? We instruct the child to give back about $4,000 a month, that's how much they were taking out of their savings, for the next 25 months. So the child over the next two years is going to give back about $100,000 in assets. Okay? So after uh, 25 months later, the child is giving back about $100,000. The gift has been reduced from 220 to 120,000 because of the gift back by the child, and this reduces the penalty from 44 months to 25 months. So what happens? The husband reapplies for Medicaid in month 25, and they're going to say, "Well, it's not been 44 months." And the husband said, "As well, my child gave back 100,000." So they're going to look at all your bank statements and look, verify that that money's been put in there. It's been spent on the nursing home. They're going to double check all that. And when Medicaid gets done, they're going to say, okay, you are correct. The net gift is $125,000, which is a 24.21 month gift and a penalty. And so now the husband is qualified in month 25. So what is the results? Where are we at after two years? The home is 100% protected. And of the $150,000 in savings, we have saved $50,000. How important is that last $50,000 to that stay-at-home spouse? that's all the money she's ever going to have unless she wants to buy So it's very important that she have that. So the clients have protected about $260,000. And in this case, uh, the assets are probably sitting in an irrevocable asset protection trust. So, And we've saved about 72% of the assets, roughly. And if we actually had some time and got a little more complicated, we could bump that up to probably 75, 80, maybe 85 percent with some other things that could be done. So uh, you just kind of apply several different layering techniques to kind of shave this, shave this down as best you can. So any questions or thoughts? Frank, questions? Yes, sir. This. She asked her <laughs> She's saying, is somebody in their 50s or, or even in their 60s, is there something they can be doing now? My recommendation is seriously look at long-term care insurance. Yesterday, I ran into a couple. They're in the early 60s. He's had a stroke. They were in there just doing some stuff, just a regular revocable trust. Uh, they've got a very nice home. They don't have a whole, they got some savings, not a, not a tremendous amount, but he's not even receiving his retirement yet because, you know, he's not 65. But they had probably the best long-term care policies I've seen. It was like 280 bucks a day because they had inflation riders on it. And uh, her premium, well, his premium was like $1,000 a year and hers was like 700 bucks a year. But now they've had them for eight or nine years. So. That's something that, that is very affordable when you're in your 50s, maybe even in your 60s. Then you never have to worry about any of this stuff. So that, that's my solution for younger people. Yes, sir. You mentioned you gave an example of during the rehab period, mm -hmm. and then the other example, if someone is not in the rehab period, the other examples, are they the same thing that's applicable? Or yeah, what happens is magical the, 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 the thing that's magical about rehab is this. You actually, most of the time when you just give assets away, you just wait five years. And then when you apply for Medicaid, the question is, have you made any gifts in the last five years? And the answer is no. So everything's protected. The magic about rehab is this. If you have less than about three to 400,000 in assets, that's, that's my average client's less than that, 
they can protect everything in less than five years. Now, if I've got a client that's got six or seven or eight hundred thousand dollars, it's just going to be five years because of the way they calculate the penalty. I have got like I had one. This was about two years ago. Uh, Mama had a, about a sixty thousand dollar home. She went into rehab. We did the rehab one two three plan. She got out in uh, I guess uh, we applied in May. And she got out in June. The house was protected in November. She didn't go back. She was back at home. She but she went back in the following spring, and that entire house was protected. So that's the time that if she had not been in rehab, what would have happened? We would have done the planning. We'd have done the transfers. But we're sitting there waiting five years, and then let's say three or four years from now, she goes to the nursing home. She's still not qualified because she made a gift in the last five years. What happens when you're in rehab? That's the time you can apply for Medicaid and get the penalty started. And the penalty can run even while you're at home. Like in that example, she, she came home in, May, in June, and it, it continued to run June, July, August, September. November the 1st, she was qualified for Medicaid. Now, she didn't go back to the nursing home. Just like Jane, Jane didn't go home, you know, and, and uh, she went home, and 25 months later, she's out in the yard planting flowers, you know. But if she goes in or her husband goes in in month 25, 26, 27, or thereafter, everything is protected as opposed to waiting till they get home and then planning then they just got to wait five years so that's the event just ma'am what is the minimum age to be eligible for that nursing home it's usually 65, 65 65 yeah for most people yes part of what you asked a while ago with the third uh, the rehab part of why you apply for Medicaid then is typically you're going to be there for 30 days. There's a 30 day, you cannot apply for long-term care Medicaid unless you've been institutionalized in a facility for 30 days. And I believe they will count the hospital stay as part of that 30. I've heard that. I don't yeah, know. What, what happens is, is this too, is generally the way that works, I'm do it on time, the way that works is once you go into a hospital for three bed nights, you leave, you go to rehab, Rehab is usually paid by Medicare for the first 20 days. If you have a Medicare Part B supplement, like Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Humana, and United Healthcare, they'll pay for day 21 through 100 as long as you continue to improve, and that's determined by the doctor at the nursing home. So usually most of my clients uh, will get a total of about 30 to 45 days. I've got three or four a year that will get the full 100 days just because of their, their condition. But most people don't get the full 100 days. They're released somewhere around day 30 to 45, maybe day 60. So when I got people coming in saying, hey, we're not worried about this. We got 100 days. I said, no, you don't. You might, but you're going to be one of those few that get that full 100 days. So that's when we need to start planning right away. Very good. Good questions. Ms. Matt. How does all that affect children? Is that taxable income for the children? No. Any gifts to the kids or not, the only thing would be taxable if they had IRAs. Okay, and there's ways to kind of work around that as well. What about the limit? How much you can pass on? Well, you can give away, the rules are you can give away $14,000 per year per person. Okay. If you give more than that, you're supposed to file a gift tax return. And those are now called taxable gifts. But you don't pay any gift taxes or estate taxes until your total gifts exceed $5.5 million. Oh. So that, that, that might be, if you got that much, we're not doing this kind of planning. Okay, we're doing estate planning. Estate planning. Good questions. All right, and of course, Jane goes in, she's going to be qualified as well. That's who we were planning for in the first place. Uh, we got through the questions. All right, VA benefits. I love talking about this benefit because very few people know about it and lots of people can qualify for it. There's veteran benefits for wartime veterans and their widows. It's called aid in attendance. Uh, the, uh, maybe the official name is called the approved pension benefit. And this is a pension benefit for wartime veterans, okay, uh, and their widows. Um, the veteran can receive up to, these are some pretty substantial amounts, $2,120 a month for a married veteran, $1,789 for a veteran who is single or widowed, and $1,149 for a widow of a veteran, okay? And it is a tax-free benefit. Because I'm a CPA, we do lots of tax planning, and, and we like that, that it doesn't change our tax rate causes to pay taxes. There's three military requirements for you to qualify. Uh, first of all, the veteran has to have 90 days of active duty. How do we know that? We look at the form DD-214. Everybody knows if you're a veteran, you, you know what your DD-214 is. You have to have one day, at least 
a one day of service during a declared state of war. Okay? And we'll talk about what that is in a moment. And then you have to have an honorable discharge or something other than a dishonorable discharge. The declared states of war are World War II, which I don't think hardly any World War II one veterans or, or most of them have passed away. So it's World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and the Gulf and the War. And those are those dates are set by Congress. <coughs> You know, and I've had some people say, well, was Vietnam really a war? Well, for this benefit, it was a war, there are set dates. So if you were in Vietnam before 1964, you could also be qualified because those were called military advisors. You could also qualify for Vietnam boots on the ground before this 1964 day. Now there's a means test. Ah, oh, I know there was a means test. So what is that? So if you make too much income or you make too much, have too much assets, you don't qualify. But that's the tricky part. That's the part that we can help people with. First of all, most people over age 65, that you've got to be over 65 to qualify for this benefit. There has to be some, some minor medical need. My average client over 70, 90% of them is going to qualify medically. Okay? Well, how do I get that? We have these forms out on our office every day. It's form 21-2680. So if you need that form, call us. We'll give you the form. It's no big deal. You get the VA office. Now, there's a net worth test and an income test. And that's when most veterans say, oh, I know there's a catch to this. But kind of follow me here because it's not what you think. There's a net worth test. You can have a home at up to $80,000. Well, many of my veterans have more than $80,000 in savings and investments. So what do we do if that's the case? You can gift it to a child just like we did in Medicaid plan. So, in Medicaid, what's the waiting period? Five years. What's the waiting period for VA attendance? There is no waiting period. I have had clients that have done this planning, 30 days later, they're applying for VA and they qualify for this benefit. Now, here's the, here's the caution of the warning. The VA is trying to change this. They tried to pass a law to put a three-year penalty and some other rules and regulations that go into, that they're looking at putting a three-year penalty on these transfers they tried to pass the law in 2013 and 14, both times it was struck down. So they proposed in January of 2015 just a regulation saying we're going to impose a <coughs> That is going through the process right now, so it's probably going to get passed this year, but next year there's a pretty fair chance. I'm a member of the National Academy of Law Attorneys, and several, they, that and several other organizations are fighting to keep this benefit uh, because there's some other things that's in there that we don't like as well. So here's the income test. If you make too much income, you don't qualify. How much income can I make? Those are the maximum incomes. Now that's not very much. So I'm not paying. I make more than that. Well, first of all, this is the income for VA purposes, not gross income. That's the confusing part. So income for VA purposes, IVAP is not gross income. IVAP is income for VA purposes, is gross income minus all unreimbursed medical expenses <clears throat> equals IVAP. What are medical expenses? Pretty much anything you can imagine being medical will be included. Certainly your medical insurance, your co-pays, deductibles, prescriptions, other over-the-counter medications. I've even seen them except vitamins, you know, all kinds of stuff, plus in-home care. That's the one you can control. So you can decide how much care. And a lot of our veterans and a lot of our widows, I can tell by visiting with them, they need some in-home care. I mean, they really do. They're getting to the point where they can't cook, they can't clean, there's a lot of things that they can't do. So the kids are pitching in trying to help keep mom or dad at home, okay? So here's a widow, and this is why I tell people, don't just necessarily run down to the VA office and apply for this, because this widow right here, she makes $1,200 a month. And they're, they're going to tell her, we're sorry, ma'am, you make more than $1,149, so you don't qualify. Well, you don't know that until we get the medical expenses. Turns out, because I've had this happen, they've gone down there and said, man, I don't qualify. So they turn around and they leave. They come in here and I said, well, let's see, what are your medical expenses? Well, we added all up, it's about $430 a month. So her IVAP is $770 a month. Is that less than $1149? It sure is. So they're going to give her enough aid and attendance to get her up to $1149. So in this case, this widow is going to get about $379 a month. Then once she gets qualified, she may not have a Medicare Part B supplement because she can't afford it. So she gets that the next year and adds that in. I even had a veteran uh, that had a bad back. He was getting ready to apply for this. And he bought this, this Tempur-Pedic bed, it was like $3,000. Uh, 
Um, it was $50 a month was his payment because he didn't have a lot of income. So I said, go to your VA doctor and get a prescription for a tempur bed. So he calls back and he says, well, they arrived at my front door with a hospital bed. I said, what, what are you doing here? He says, well, you work in a hospital bed. No, 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 I don't need, no. So he sent them back. So he went back and said, get it in writing, tempur bed. So she wrote the prescription. She said, the VA's not going to give this to you. It doesn't matter if they're going to give it to you. So we turned all that in with his VA application and his benefit was $50 a month more than it would have been. So who's paying for the bed now? The VA. Now his back is much better. So these are just little things that can be done. Do uh, they qualify for that if they're already in the nursing home, or is that just if they're not No, if they're an assisted, assisted living or nursing home, they qualify for this. So if you've got a veteran that has pretty good income, and an extra $2,000 a month would be enough to make up that shortfall, then they're going to have to qualify for Medicaid at all. This may be the only benefit they need. And i got a lot of veterans that are assisted living, and um, they're actually putting a little bit of money back because of all the, you know, everything put together. So, Also, always apply for a fully developed claim or fast track claim. These are computer, uh, these are computer or electronic uh, applications. If you go somewhere where they do a paper application, you're looking at probably a 6 to 12 month approval time. If it's a fully developed or electronic claim, 6 to 12 weeks. I've had one of these approved in four weeks. So make sure we've got a list of, of, of the counties that do that. So I've, I've sent people to Heber Springs, I've sent them to Little Rock. So, uh, you know, uh, this can be a real time saver. Also, if you get this on this benefit, always complete the annual evaluation. The VA came out a few years ago and said, you don't have to fill out the annual evaluation anymore. The reason being, what happens to most uh, veterans' medical, uh, medical expenses each year? What happens to the VA benefit? It goes up. So they said, don't worry about filling that out anymore. We know what your income is. Yeah, they know what the income is, but they don't know what your medical expenses are. So here's an example. I've got veteran A and veteran B. Same age, same income, same medical expenses, living next door to each other. Everything's exactly the same. So they both go and apply for the VA in 2014, and they're both getting $500 a month. Well, the next year, they get this letter. You don't have to fill out the EVR. So veteran B, he throws it in the trash can. Veteran A says, I think I'm going to fill mine out because my expenses for both of them went up $300 a month. So, in 2015, Veteran A is now getting $800 a month, and Veteran A, who didn't fill out the evaluation, is getting $500. Well, each year as medical expenses go up, Veteran A, he's filling his out, and all of a sudden, after a few years, he's getting the maximum benefit, $2,120 a month, and he comments to his buddy, man, this VA benefit is great. He goes, well, how come you're getting 2120 and I'm getting 500? Do you ever fill out your annual evaluations? No, they said I don't have to. Well, they're just going to keep, keep paying you $500 a month for the rest of your life. If you start filling out your evaluation, he can immediately jump up to the full benefit if his expenses were the same. So always fill out those evaluations because I got people that man, I didn't fill those out in several years. Fill those out because they can put a lot more money in your pocket. Coordination between all these benefits we deal with long term care policy benefits, we deal with Medicaid, we deal with Medicare, VA uh, benefits, and service connected benefits. Uh, and in essence, we're just developing a long term care plan to make sure you get all benefits that you're qualified for. Any questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry to do this, but I got to throw a plug in real quick. For Conway Healthcare and Rehab. Uh, also, <laughs> yeah, well, you gotta do it when you can. Uh, also, we are a VA facility, not all facilities are. If you are a veteran with certain, it depends on your service connection, and it has to be such and such. 70%? 70%, I think, is what it mm -hmm. is. If you were injured during the foreign war, anything like that, we have 12 veterans right now in our facility where the VA pays every bit of their stay. They do not have to use any of their assets. The VA pays for the room and board, medicine, the whole thing is taken care of. So if you're a veteran, that one other thing, uh, what he's talking about, if you're 70% service-connected disability rating or greater, the VA will pick up your long-term care at his facility, and there's other facilities right as well. But here's the key. If you've got a veteran that is at a 50 or 60% level, and they go into the nursing home, I had one that was in the hospital in rehab in Jacksonville. He was like at 40%, I believe, maybe 50%. I said, when's the last time you got your disability rating reevaluated? He said, I never have. 
It's been 30 years. First thing, get your disability rating done. So he probably went from 50 to 70 or 80. Then his nursing home was paid for. So if it's at least every five years, get your disability rating reevaluated. And generally, they'll go up as the older that you get. Question? Yes. Long-term care policies. Yes, sir. Who, who out there? I don't, I don't want you to there's, a, there, uh, there's a, uh, we, we don't have anybody in particular, but I tell people to look in your phone book or look in uh, anybody that advertises or does lots of, of long-term care. You can also talk to your homeowners a lot of times. Your local agent that already does your stuff will do. So you get a quote from two or three different places okay. and then just see what's the best. Normally what you want if you're under 65 or 70, you want the inflation protection rider. There's a guy up here that I won't mention any names, but uh, he's my best tenant. He's a guy, warm, nice guy. <laughs> can, I, can I ask you just one other little question? Sure. Was any of this tied to your lease, the promotion? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, he says, you're going to have to talk to my attorney about that, okay? <laughs> All I heard was some threats. <laughs> Also, we do we do free consultations. So if you just got a question, I have people that come to these workshops, and they just come in, they spend ten or fifteen minutes asking questions, and they leave, and that's it. So there's no uh, no charge or anything. So anyway, we also have offices in uh, Little Rock as well, and we do evening appointments on Monday nights. So to make that convenient for folks, I've enjoyed visiting with y'all. If y'all have any questions, I'll stick around for a few minutes. But I like y'all having an appointment back in the office here in just a little bit, so I'm mindful of your time. Thank y'all. Appreciate it.